All right, very well. Thank you again, Marlon, and you and your team for organizing this. Uh, my name is Domna Banaco. I'm a postdoc at the Event Lab at the University uh, of Barcelona. The Event Lab is led by Professor Maslater, and uh, we're doing uh, work uh, in virtual reality for quite some time now. Um, so today I am going to talk to you about uh, um, walking in groups in, with the help of immersive virtual reality and specifically uh, temporal coupling during in-group and out-group interactions. Um, but before I get uh, into the specifics of the study I want to talk to you about, I'm going to present you briefly um, uh, the project that this study falls uh, under, although it is a collaborative uh, uh, study, as I will explain later. Uh, but let me tell you a few minutes about the project first. Uh, the project is called uh, Motif. Uh, it's an uh, ERC uh, project uh, led by Professor Slater, and it stands for Moments in Time in Immersive Virtual Reality. Before I say anything else, just consider the next video. A little bit of music to start the day. All right, so I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you, if not all of you, uh, know that uh, this is a Dire Straits concert. It was recorded back in 1983 at the Hammersmith Audion in, uh, in London. And um, this is what the Motive project is about, really, is to see how we can use virtual reality to give people the, uh, the experience of, live, of uh, living through uh, such a historical event and participants really give the participants the feeling that they find themselves uh, in this uh, concert, something that in virtual reality we refer to as place illusion and that the events that are happening around them are, are actually real, known as possibility. So the, in order to give a, um, you know, a framework to conduct our research, the application is going to be constructed around this uh, famous uh, event from, from, from that era. Uh, but the long-term goal of the project is to really use the methodology, at least from a, a technical point of view, to really reconstruct uh, any such historical uh, experiences and, and really make you, you know, maybe some of you attended this concert, uh, maybe uh, others, could attend this concert but not have the experience, so there might be those amongst you who were not even born back then, but they are uh, fans of Dire Straits and they would like to live this experience for the first time or read. So this um, uh, this uh, project uh, is um, has a different components, uh, and uh, uh, some uh, one of these is really is, uh, what is called an agent based model. And the idea is to populate uh, the, uh, the, the concert scenario with uh, thousands in reality of agents or virtual agents. And these agents uh, can exhibit, uh, can have uh, their own uh, behavior. And this behavior can be driven by music. And, and of course, the participant, um, the user will be embedded in this scenario as an agent. And all of the agents, participants and the virtual ones can also have their own personality, they have their own emotional uh, state, and they can take uh, actions during the experience. And these actions can really affect those around them, and they can also affect how the whole scenario, the whole experience uh, unfolds. So one of the uh, one of the ideas is to exploit um, the notion of uh, body ownership, uh, ourselves being uh, in a different body or in our body, in our own body during the virtual experience and see how this uh, affects our behavior. So imagine that you can not only attend the concert as yourself, but you can attend the concert as somebody else, either as somebody else in the audience, or even more interestingly, what if you could attend the concert by being in, uh, in the actual band? What if you were the lead guitarist, for example? Uh, how would that affect uh, your behavior? How would that affect your attitude? And how would your actions affect, uh, in turn, the behavior of, your virtual, of the virtual crowd that is participating? So that's the notion of uh, body ownership. And, and of course, uh, so this, this is a concert, 
uh, as a participant, you need to get to uh, the concert uh, venue and you need to find your way around, uh, etc. So we are going to uh, exploit um, multi-sensory principles that are involved in uh, body ownership illusions and such in order to study interactions. Uh, with uh, with a virtual crowd in order to study navigation uh, from at least from a technical point of view, but also uh, what is uh, um, usually encountered in virtual reality environments that of simulator uh, sickness and how we can uh, overcome this. So uh, th these are all the different components that we're going to study, and of course it's the technical part like I mentioned before, and then there is the the research part. So. Uh, regarding uh, the technical part, that is uh, really, it's not the end goal, but the, really the means to a goal. Um, the main component is modeling our environment, right? In this case, it is modeling uh, the hemispheric uh, of Audion and the environment, the immediate environment around it, as well as, as uh, the, the interior of it. And uh, this is an example, for example, uh, for instance, that uh, my colleagues are working on at the event lab. You see a photo of the uh, of the Audion at the bottom screen, and at the top you see what uh, the modeling modeling looks like um, at is so far from, from the outside. So that's one part and it's based um, on, uh, you know, on material that already exists in reality. This can be uh, photos or plans of the venue uh, and, and so on. Now, the second part of the modeling is modeling the crowd, which is really a big, big part, as I mentioned before, of, of the entire, of the whole project. And then the crowd can be uh, uh, the audience, uh, and uh, it's also the the band, the band that are performing on stage. And in order to uh, reconstruct this, uh, we are based on computer vision uh, techniques that my colleagues are working on. And uh, any material really that we can find, such as uh, DVDs or other videos that are posted online in order to extract this uh, information. Uh, but of course, since uh, uh, you as, a, as a, an audience member can uh, Enter the can have this uh, experience. We are uh, we can also reconstruct your uh, own body and really place you inside the environment. This is um, a short example of uh, of a reconstruction of the of, of the band based on DVD uh, footage. Footage. This, this is the original DVD, and this is uh, very briefly. Uh, what my colleagues are working on, so you can uh, extract the skeletal bows of the of the musicians, even from a two D two D content, and then translate into three D content. You, of course, you can see this is at a very uh, very early stage. There is a lot of tittering, uh, but the the end goal is to be able to do this automatically, and not only for um, this person specific occasion, but to expand it to, to a larger set of uh, examples. All right, so the question is now, why these uh, working groups in virtual reality? So I mentioned uh, before that the uh, part of the, of the project concerns uh, the crowd, the virtual crowd, the audience of the, uh, of the experience having their own behavior. And this behavior affecting yours or the other way around and there is a lot of literature we've already had a lot of uh, interesting uh, talks about the psycholo psychological mechanisms that affect our social cognition and how we if we coordinate our actions in time and space with the others this gives us this feeling of uh, being together uh, in in group and uh, very often we uh, perceive and we um, integrate uh, the sounds and the proprioceptive information of our footsteps with the sounds of others. All right, so this uh, gives us this sense of being uh, part of a uh, of group. So uh, this, is, uh, this is an easy way of, of, uh, of addressing what we would like to do with the end goal of expanding this um, uh, group walking to other more complicated actions as part of the virtual uh, scenario which uh, relates to music. I'm going to talk about it in, uh, in a little while. So the question then here is how does our temporal coupling with the sounds of others during 
and outgroup interactions affect our mental body representation, our perception of interpersonal distance and very personal space, and synchronization in joint action. And like I mentioned before, this is a collaborative um, uh, project. Uh, with uh, our dear Merle from here, <laughs> yes, and of course, I, Professor Ana Tajadora Jimenez from the University of Carlos III in Madrid, who is an expert in, uh, uh, in auditory uh, integration. Now, let me give you a couple of details about this specific project. Uh, like I said, it is going, it is implemented in, uh, in virtual reality. And uh, we're talking about in-group and out-group interactions. So this is um, a within our group's uh, design uh, where we manipulate two factors. The first uh, factor that we refer to as uh, group size concerns the number of virtual agents that we have present at the scene. So we have, as you see here at the top, uh, the top of the screen, either a small group. Now uh, the participant is placed here in the middle. Um, he or she is not rendered at this, uh, at this image, but the idea is to be uh, placed here in the middle. And then he or she is surrounded by six, uh, six virtual agents or uh, the participant is part of a large group with uh, 50 or more uh, participants uh, in the scene, which would, would actually be the case uh, during a live concert um, uh, scenario. Now, the second, uh, the second factor is uh, group similarity. And this is where we uh, see the in-group and uh, out-group uh, 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 assembled. So we have um, uh, the, the participants are uh, Caucasian, they're always going to be Caucasian, and uh, we will manipulate the, the, the body of the crowd that surrounds them. So the crowd can either be part, part of the in group, so they can have the same racial characteristics as the participant, or they can be of a different uh, race. So in this case, we have uh, white versus uh, black. And I'm going to tell you a little bit why we chose to go with this setting. I'm just going to show you a video first of the of the experience and what the participants actually have to do. So like I said before, participants are going to be embedded in the scenario. They will have a virtual body and they will have full synchrony over the virtual body. So the virtual body uh, will move uh, follow their own movements. They can see it from the first person perspective, as seen here. They look down, they can see their, the rest of the body. We have full body tracking. Now, unfortunately, I did not have the trackers to record the movement of the lower body here, but they can actually see, uh, they can walk around and they can see their, their uh, body uh, moving. And we have a first phase where they get acquainted with the environment and with the task. Now, the task is for them to start walking in place following the rhythm of a metronome that sounds in this uh, uh, in this vein in this concert in this concert hall and uh, while the crowd around them uh, are also going uh, to follow the same the same rhythm so this is an example of what it looks like with a small white uh, crowd So we have a total of uh, 10 trials uh, for, each, uh, for each block, and each trial lasts about 12 seconds. That is the sound of the metronome. And this is an example of the big crowd, again, in the in-group condition. Same task. This is what it really uh, sounds like. Uh, I need to uh, tell you here that the, the sounds are uh, based on some uh, real sounds that we took from a previous experiment. So we extracted those and we applied on the virtual characters so that they seem as if, as if they're walking uh, in place based on this, uh, based on this uh, input. Okay, and this is the, the, list, the big crowd and that's an example of uh, a participant performing performing the task and what they see. All right. Oh, for some reason it goes backward. I'm sorry about that. All right. So what we're looking at is gate synchronization performance, and we specifically want to uh, look at synchronization with the beat. 
uh, with each, each individual at least surrounding uh, the participant immediately. And we can also extract uh, data based on the, um, on the head-mounted display. So we can uh, know at each time where the participant uh, is looking. And we're also looking at synchronization with the group in average. Uh, we're also uh, analyzing temporal co coordination, including asynchrony, and we have some uh, more subjective um, uh, data, such as uh, uh, representation of uh, body and space, uh, emotional state, uh, self-other affiliation, and so on. So our hypothesis is that participants will synchronize faster and more accurately when surrounded by members of the in-group, and the, um, the group size will also modulate uh, this, uh, this effect. Now, why this in-group and out-group, like I mentioned before? So in previous, uh, some previous studies in immersive virtual reality, we found that when we uh, put participants in a different race uh, virtual body, then this affects uh, their implicit attitudes towards racial bias. And we have found a decrease in implicit racial bias that has been shown to be uh, sustained at least uh, a week after participants have this virtual experience. In a more, in, in a more recent study, uh, we saw that the type of the experience, whether positive or negative, can also affect the, these results with negative experiences actually resulting in an increase of, of racial bias. In this direction, in mimicry, for example, Hassler and colleagues showed that when participants are embodied in a virtual body of the same skin color as theirs, then they tend to mimic the virtual character uh, more than the than the opposite uh, body, at least with respect to uh, body movements. For instance, and, and that is irrespective of the type of the body that you see yourself in virtual reality. So if you see yourself in a white virtual body, then you will tend to mimic more the white, the other white virtual character. Whether if you are embodied in a black virtual body, you will tend to mimic more the black virtual character. Uh, so we're interested to see how this experience of being in a, in a concert and how you, uh, the others, uh, affect your own behavior, how you can affect others' behavior, and so on. We started, like I said before, with uh, this uh, task of walking in place because it is a simple task and we can extract uh, information much uh, easier than more complicated movement. And it's also based in, um, uh, on, on previous studies, so we can compare this, uh, this effect. But the idea is really to apply it to more complicated movements. Uh, in, in, in a virtual uh, scenario like this, you will start dancing. So we want to see if those around you start dancing, as in, in a real concert, if they start singing along with the singer, how this is going to affect you. Is, being part of an in-group or out-group play going to play a role in this? Or what if, like I said before, you are actually a member of the band and you have the power to influence how the crowd reacts below? So there are a lot of uh, different uh, ideas that were interesting in implemented, but this is uh, a base to start from. And uh, unfortunately, I know that you're looking forward to seeing some results, but due to the circumstances, we were not able to run the study that we were planning to do last March. But now, thankfully, <laughs> and thanks to Mara and her amazing team, the study is running at this moment uh, in, uh, in Munich. So we hope that we do have some results soon to show you maybe some other time in another conference, in a workshop. I'm really sorry that I cannot show you anything. Um, I'm just going to leave you on a happy music uh, note and with a lot of curiosity. I just like to thank my colleagues at the event lab, especially those who are working on the technical part in the making the whole concept of motive reality. There's a lot of work going on in the background in order to do, in order to conduct our research. And uh, thank uh, you for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> thank you, Domna. And thank you for that musical interlude. I uh, see, I don't need to sing after all. Uh, I, uh, I obviously was very happy to see uh, our work um, out there uh, being highlighted. And yes, it will be 
wonderful when we finally can uh, look into the data on this exciting project. Um, I will be talking a little bit more about group walking as a model of group coordination. And obviously we're very excited to look uh, to the next step, if you'll excuse the pun, to more complex movements like dance. And we spoke to Stephen Brown yesterday about why dance is such a great uh, model of group coordination, because as he said, you get uh, music for free, as it were. So uh, we, have, um, we have lots of threads being um, pulled together with your talk. So thank you very much for that. I, I have one uh, question, um, which I obviously, for some reason, wasn't aware of. So this, it was great to hear you put it into the context of the Motive Project. And that was, you showed the, you know, the, the, the Odeon, um, first of all. And I think that that was great because it reminds us about these other factors that uh, will go into determining whether and how well we coordinate with others in this case. Um, you know, the context of that, of that stadium and the excitement of waiting to go inside or once you are inside. So I thought that that was really great. And maybe if you have um, something to say about that. But then the other thing that um, also struck me is that within that context, you know, because you've made it more ecological and you've placed it inside this very uh, atmospheric uh, context of, of going to a concert, it occurred to me you also have the ability to compare two kinds of group coordination. Maybe this is obviously in, in mind, but you know, I was thinking if you're outside the stadium, you're in this hustle bustle, large crowd, but it's without really um, wanting to coordinate with them per se, you're just walking through the line to get to the, to the entrance. Whereas once you're inside that building, once you've crossed that threshold, you now go more into, so you leave the field of you know, uh, social physics and, and organization of crowds, into what we've been talking about up until now uh, in this conference, which is you know, um, usually quite active uh, group coordination. You've talked about some spontaneous effects as well. Obviously, if you, if you feel the music, you might start swaying, but really your, your context of the concert captures all those three different kinds of coordination. So I thought that was great. So if you have anything to say on either of those two things, uh, that would be wonderful. So yes, no, it's exactly like you mentioned, we have, uh, we have the chance to just look at coordination at all these different stages because and, and at each different stage, you do have, uh, I, I said before, I talked about the emotional state and it's gonna be different across all these, uh, these stages. You walk into the concert, start, um, at the start of the concert, by the end of the concert. And well, another, uh, another factor like, we said we, we said before so what if you are part of the band and in the previous talk we you discussed leadership so that's another another avenue uh what happens when you start influencing the crowd instead of you being part uh, of, of crowd and the other way around uh so there is a lot of possibilities to do there and and it's true that we do not only concentrate on uh, you having the experience inside uh the concert which one could argue there are already uh, a few experiences of uh, uh, of such uh, setups in virtual reality, but it's the whole process of you attending a concert from start to end. Even that involves, you know, you leaving from home and all the excitement of getting there and be ready to be part uh, of the concert. Uh, so we're definitely open to uh, ideas and suggestions and why not collaborations. There's a lot to investigate and uh, um, collaboration in this uh, environment can just take so many different avenues that we're ready to explore. Well, I was exactly gonna say that, that probably it would be worthwhile getting in touch with people who are more interested in the social physics of crowd movement, for example, and then to use <laughs> similar approaches maybe across the different kinds of coordination. You do have some questions coming in um, from Liam Cross, who is going to be giving a talk later today. Uh, he says, thank you for the really great talk. There's some work by Lyndon Miles showing that the in-out group um, uh, coordination relationship may go the other way. Uh, in other words, in non-competitive and dyadic situations, people coordinate more tightly without than in in-group members. I wondered if you thought he could, uh, he, the same could happen in larger virtual groups like you have. Yes, that's a very interesting question, actually, Sparta, but we would like to, to address Merlin, to feel free to, to, uh, to also answer part of it uh, if, you, if you want. Uh, so the idea for now is that, uh, and what we've seen actually from some pilot uh, studies, people have, do have different experiences, whether it's in-group and out-group, and whether it's a small or a big group. So we've already seen that for some people, 
they really liked this experience of being part of a big group within the specific scenario, right? We're talking about a, co a concert, so it might be different to some other, just some other experience. But in this case, people really enjoyed being part of a big group rather than being with six other people that felt uh, awkward, uh, awkward. And I don't know how this will translate in our results, in our actual results. Now I'm just speaking from anecdotally, anecdotally from, uh, from, from our pilots. Um, but uh, I really, I really don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that. It might go uh, the other way around, like previous research has shown. Uh, like I said, in uh, towards the end of the talk, we've also seen in a recent study that the, uh, the the situation, the actual situation, with positive or negative, can also modulate this uh, effect of. Uh, you embodied it in, in, in the concert. And it's left to see, yes, how the actual group, big or small, is going to play a role in that. Whether it's going to play a role, we suspect that it will, but we don't know for sure, maybe, maybe it doesn't. But it will definitely tell us something about how people prefer to live through such experiences. Because in the end, uh, what does it take to really make you feel that you are part of the concert? This is really a question that we want to answer as part of the Motive project. What does it take to make you feel that you're there and that the concert is really taking place? Do you need to be part of a big group or you standing there in the middle of a concert is enough to, to experience it as you would like to? So I think that that is a perfect place to, to bring your talk to a close where we think about this idea of similarity, which we came up in talks yesterday, but also about what kind of models we can use empirically to get us closer to understanding what it means to be part of a group, to coordinate with a group. Um, we're going to take a, 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 ch a change of uh, pace now to think more of the clinical perspective. So thank you, Domina, for your talk and your time uh, and work in neurotypicals. We switch now to our next.